Welcome back to the channel. Here we go. Deep in the remote mountainous wilderness of Montana in the United States, we find this remarkable structure known as the Sage Wall. This imposing megalithic wonder is composed of massive polygonal granite stone blocks intricately stacked and aligned in a perfectly straight line that extends up to 275 feet in length, which is around 84 meters, although it's believed that it extends additionally underground. Its height reaches up to 25 feet or 8 meters, with the largest of the stone blocks weighing 91 tons. In fact, it is believed that the structure continues an additional 15 feet beneath the ground, making it around 40 feet tall if fully excavated. The wall's unique features, such as its straight lines and angular formations, set it apart from the natural geological formations commonly found in the region. The granite stone blocks appear as if they were cut, stacked, and pieced together like a puzzle, with each block interlocking with the next one. It's known that granite does not split into 90-degree consistent corners and angles, which made many researchers believe this could be some sort of prehistoric megalithic structure. The reason you've likely never come across or heard of the Sage Wall is due to its location on private land, rendering it virtually unknown to the scientific community. The landowners themselves, Christopher Borton and Linda Welsh, were unaware of the wall's presence for many years. Nestled on a mountainside, the wall was concealed by a dense canopy of fallen trees and thick foliage that had covered it for centuries, if not millennia. This natural camouflage made the wall nearly impossible to detect, especially since very few people had ever set foot in the area. The site of the Sage Wall was first discovered relatively recently. It came to light when the landowners decided to clear a portion of their property that had been heavily forested and covered with dense foliage for centuries. As they began clearing the fallen trees and thick underbrush on the side of the mountain, they stumbled upon the wall-like structure. This accidental discovery revealed the previously hidden and virtually unknown Sage Wall, prompting further investigation and interest from both the landowners and the scientific community. The wall's precise interlocking stones bore a striking resemblance to ancient polygonal masonry found in other parts of the world, such as the megalithic walls in Peru, Egypt, Turkey, Greece, Easter Island, Japan, and many other places around the globe. Does this mean that the Sage Wall of Montana is one of the many prehistoric megalithic sites destroyed thousands of years ago by an ancient cataclysm? Of course, most people dismiss the site as a natural formation. But how could this be a mere natural formation when it's clearly seen that the wall is perfectly straight lined? We know that a common feature of the megalithic stone walls around the world is the mysterious knobs on the surface of the stones. All of the megalithic ancient sites around the world have these knobs, whether you're in Peru, Egypt, India, China, or elsewhere, and no one knows their real purpose. If the sage wall of Montana was indeed a man-made creation, would we not see the same knobs on the stone blocks? Interestingly, Michael Collins, the host of the remarkable YouTube channel Wandering Wolf, who documents many ancient sites around the world, visited the Sage Wall and was surprised to discover that, like in those other megalithic sites around the world, the Sage Wall also possessed numerous knobs in different sizes on different parts of the wall. So walking up right on the trail, another what looks like nub. How can these knobs be a natural formation? And what are the odds for the same type of knobs to be found on granite blocks, fitted in the same way as the other ancient megalithic walls on the globe? But the knobs weren't the only strange thing noted by Michael. He found that all across the area, there are large channels and additional walls, all made of tightly fitted and perfectly cut stone blocks, and all aligned in exact straight lines. It was as if this entire place was a prehistoric complex with various structures that have now collapsed and eroded. He also showcased stones that seem to be artificially modified, like this one, for example, which resembles a granite piece from Karnak, Egypt, with a square cut, a channel, and a circle. Although the sage wall piece is extremely eroded and barely visible, it's clearly seen that these cuts and grooves are artificially made. And above sage wall, we can see these straight, smooth form shoots that flow down the side of a mountain. They appear like polished concrete and could have been used as water channels. There were also numerous stones with a variety of round cavities on their surface, known as cup marks. Ancient cup marks, also known as cupules, are among the oldest forms of rock art, dating back to prehistoric times and can be found in various locations around the world. Their exact purpose is unknown, although the prevailing hypothesis is that they had practical uses, such as grinding or processing food and materials. 
In our documentary on the Kaimanawa Wall of New Zealand, which is another supposed prehistoric structure built by an unknown civilization, we showed you another interesting discovery of a stone with cup mark. And if you compare the cup marks found in Montana with the marks on this large 125-ton stone block from Saxe Huaman, Peru, we can find another similarity between these ancient sites. If when we say advanced technology, we often look in the futuristic sense, uh, artificial intelligence, robots. But if you think about it, the technology in the past can still be uh, considered futuristic. I mean, we still don't know how they were built, who put them there. And we dismiss the technology in the past simply because we can't find any answers. So instead, we look in the future. Atlantis was Antarctica, and they had such a high level of civilization, right? How high a level? How high a level? Look at the Baalbek platform in Lebanon. The stones in the pyramid, the Great Pyramid, which we still can't figure out how the hell these things were moved and positioned, they're in the hundreds of ton range. Mm -hmm. The biggest ones are yep. in the hundreds of ton. At Baalbek in Lebanon, there is a platform which consists of three 1,300 ton stones. They're 1,200 to, to 300 tons a piece. Yeah, we've, we've, we've gone over these on the. Can you pull up those Baalbek And they monoliths? are raised on top of a 40-foot platform of smaller megaliths, right? Which, like, who does that? I mean, if you're going to drag stones <laughs> this big, wouldn't you use them as the foundation course and then put smaller stones on top? Mm. No. These people apparently decided to show off by lifting these 1,300-ton stones, these trilithons, and putting them on top of smaller right. megalithic stones. Right. And again, just like a Giza, just like at... Um, uh, Tiwanaku in Bolivia, mm -hmm. just like at uh, various sites in Peru. Look, is that is that, is that exactly. one of them? Yeah, well, no, look, that one that's oh, yeah. just by itself. The second one in the middle, yeah, with the red lines. Yeah, zoom yes. in on that. Yes, but yeah, but I want you to go back to the other one too. Yeah, you can see the scale of a there person next to those. Look at the the one above there. How small a person is next to those? Go up. Yeah, look at that. Look at the scale of that. But if no, you could go means... back to that one that was buried. Oh, the... the uh, yeah, okay, guy? right there. That okay. One. Now that is in the quarry where these stones came from. Yeah. That quarry is 50 miles away from the site. Yes. 50 miles. How did they take 1,300 ton stone? You know, 19 cranes of the highest industrial grade that we have today can't lift and move one of these. They've done the, the engineering uh, calculations. How did they move that thing 50 miles? You know why that's buried there? Because they wanted to tell us that mm. that's where the quarry was and that they've somehow managed to move that stone 50 miles to build the platform at Belbeck. Mm -hmm. All right, here's my point. That gives you a sense of the level of engineering capability of this civilization. It's beyond ours. Way beyond ours. Way beyond ours. The problem is there's no saw blades or toasters or anything in the desert out there. And there's no large-scale evidence for this civilization other than these megalithic structures Nothing. in various places in the world. You know where I think there's going to be a jackpot of a plethora of evidence for it? Under the ice of Antarctica. And here's where I'm going with this. If you're a civilization that advanced, why do you isolate yourself to Antarctica? Why would you do that? Right. You tell me. Any thoughts why you would do something like that? Why you would you isolate level, yourself? Yeah, you have this level of technology, right? And after the cataclysm, you go around the world and you build these various megalithic sites, which, which leave a record of the level of your technical achievement. How do we know it was after the cataclysm? Well, we know Giza was after the cataclysm. We do? Yeah, I mean, the ground plan dates to 10,500 B.C., and if you line that up with Plato and you line it up with the end of the Ice Age and the massive flooding, it's just after that cataclysm that that site was built. Also, you're talking about the Great Pyramid. Yes. The, well, the, the three pyramids and the Sphinx. And there are other structures like the Osirian at Abydos in Egypt. that are all in the same style. They're all in this anonymous, high precision megalithic style. And this is very interesting if you think about it they are even more advanced than us the pride we have 
right now as a civilization thinking that we are uh, way advanced than them because we have computers you know we have iPads gadgets and all that and yet we cannot with all of that we can't even recreate what they have done before we can't even find out how it came about medically modified mosquitoes have gotten the green light to be released in America they say these mosquitoes they don't bite people they just mate with the females and they're modified so that the offspring die off the lethality gene they put in it actually doesn't kill all the mosquitoes it only kills the females the males go on living in other words the GMO mosquitoes do bite humans some of the programs are about using the mosquitoes for other things like vaccinating people against their will that's, that's in September good. 2022 NPR declared that the researchers had successfully vaccinated people using these GMO mosquitoes one of the lead scientists on the program told the publication that we use the mosquitoes like they're 1,000 small flying syringes. Well, look, what's the big concern here? Well, partially true narratives are being used to roll out a program to release GMO insects. The program does not have a lasting effect. And even beyond that, the programs are linked to others that could be used to involuntarily vaccinate people. I did not agree to this. Did you? And if you think about it, if you can do this to mosquitoes, what other insects can they use, right? Let me introduce you to the people you are arguing with online. The Chinese phone farms. Now what you are seeing is just one example of the hundreds if not thousands of these that exist all around the world today. Each farm has hundreds upon hundreds of smartphones often with their screens and batteries removed, placed into racks and connected to a single computer. Each of these phones represents an individual user. One command from the computer operated by the click farmer can trigger hundreds of identical likes, follows, comments and even star ratings. And now with the introduction of artificial intelligence, they can generate intelligent human-like interactions unique to a video's topic. I mean, we've all seen how smart Ashley has got nowadays. Look forward to seeing her comment on this video. But I mean, the question is, why do all of this? Well, it can range from simple things like making money. Click farmers often get paid for fake engagement. They receive two cents for a thousand views on TikTok, 11 cents for a thousand likes on Instagram, and even get payment for streams on Spotify. I mean, to put it into perspective, six years ago, one third of all traffic generated online in China was thanks to these farms. But these farms can also go all the way up to a threat to democracy. Studies have confirmed that in 2016, Russian troll farms were found to have created thousands of fake social media accounts that pretended to be Americans supporting radical political groups, tried to influence others' opinions, and even tried to sway the election. <laughs> Look forward to this year then. This just emphasizes on the lesson that we have learned that you can't really trust what you read or see on the internet. You just gotta be careful. He's not wrong. This are the people that you interact with oftentimes these are the people who argues with you try to drain you with your energy so be careful with that Egypt what's new with you something a little crazy was discovered in here what is it archaeologists found an ancient coffin that resembles Marge Simpson not the Simpsons again yeah so I don't know did the Simpsons predict this or something maybe ancient Egyptians predicted the Simpsons. We will never know, but what we know is that the Simpsons is wild. Watch this. This is just crazy. The Simpsons again. We've heard so many uh, clips pertaining to how the Simpsons predicted things. I don't think it's that. There's something more to this that's not yet available to us. So, yeah, watch out for more. The whole story of what, you know, why Africa looks the way it does today, which obviously has a lot to do with the colonial era, a lot of that has to do with what we would now call PMC. Private military corporations. In a lot of these places, I mean, these are these people's ancestral lands. They were born there, their parents were born there, their grandparents were born there. They don't have deeds. You don't have deeds to the land you've owned for like time immemorial. There's always this problem in Africa where, you, you know, you don't really have ownership of land necessarily in the same way that we would 
see it. You know, there's no deeds. There's a village over there. This is where they graze their cattle. Well, now you're not going to be able to graze your cattle, and maybe there's, 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 we're going to have to move you. That that potentially is a great problem. And what if there's a what if there's a an uprising? Well, that that's part of so that's where we come in. To be a good investor in Africa. It's not just about having your resources and you go and buy or lease land. It is logistics. You're moving into areas where nobody has gone before. So you need people who have experience and no hesitation to use weapons, who can ensure movement of whatever resources are needed. And then you need connections with the political elite. Colonialism never ended. It just changed to neo-colonialism, where they do things like massive companies investing in these small countries, or giving loans to businesses who are therefore dependent on them, or political control. Instead of overthrowing the governments, they just support leaders, give money and weapons to rebel groups to drive out anybody who stands against them, or even global rules. These massive companies will ensure that policies are put in place, global rules will be put in place that further benefit and expand their control of the markets, even in another country. Africa has 50 to 60 percent of the remaining arable land left in the world that hasn't been quote unquote farmed. That doesn't mean that it's just sitting there without people on it. It's peopled. People are farming it. They're, they're farming it for their food, for their lives, you know, to feed their children. I think this is also one of the byproduct of the so-called evolution. We are so focused into advancing our own generation that we tend to forget the previous generations and uh, what their cultures are, how they live their lives. I mean, this is also the same thing that happens everywhere. Indigenous peoples are always the victim because of their quote-unquote lack of knowledge. Hey, if you're still here, please do me a favor and hit the thumbs up button and if you haven't already please do subscribe i make videos like this every day and i would greatly appreciate it if you can join me again tomorrow thanks have you ever wondered how the ancient egyptians managed to drill into granite with such ease almost as if they were drilling into wood or how they carved intricate details into hard stone using tools we can't even find today these questions have haunted me for years sparking a fascination that i just can't shake it all started innocently enough. After college, I found myself drawn to documentaries about ancient civilizations. One night, I watched a program about the pyramids, and something just clicked. I began reading everything I could find about ancient Egypt, diving into books, online forums, and endless videos. What struck me the most were the unanswered questions, the mysteries that modern technology still can't fully explain. I'm Jason, and what began as a casual interest quickly turned into an obsession. I was enthralled by the architectural marvels of ancient Egypt and the enigmas that surrounded their construction. How did they build the pyramids with such precision? What tools did they use to drill into granite with the ease that a carpenter drills into wood? And why can't we find any of these tools today? Despite the stories I've heard about Egypt being dusty and filled with tourist traps and scammers, I still dream of visiting one day. I want to stand before the Great Pyramid, explore the temples of Karnak, and walk through the Valley of the Kings, seeing the drill cores, the lathe-turned stone vases, and the unfinished obelisk in Aswan with my own eyes would be incredible. There's something about these ancient engineering feats that feels almost personal to me. Every piece of information I uncover only deepens my curiosity. The copper tube drills, the unexplained grooves on drill cores, the massive stone vases. Each discovery feels like a piece of a puzzle that I can't quite complete. I often find myself questioning the accepted explanations and yearning for answers that make sense. I know I'm not alone in my skepticism, but it can be frustrating when mainstream archaeology dismisses the fringe theories that captivate me. This journey into the mysteries of ancient Egypt has become a rabbit hole that I don't think I'll ever fully emerge from. But I don't mind. The pursuit of knowledge, the thrill of discovery, and the hope that someday I might unlock even a small part of the truth keep me going. Maybe, just maybe, I'll make that trip to Egypt one day. 
standing in the presence of those ancient wonders and feeling a connection to the past that books and documentaries can't fully capture is a dream I hold on to tightly. This was definitely done with tools more advanced than our present-day modern ones, because we still can't cut into granite with the ease the ancient Egyptians seemed to have, akin to a carpenter drilling into wood. This doesn't explain that, and investigators are getting mocked for speaking out about it. Drill cores like these have been found all around ancient Egypt, which were the leftover pieces thrown away by Egyptian builders after drilling into granite. Modern explanations use a bow drill made from a copper tube to demonstrate how these holes were drilled. And they work. With busted, we can move on, right? Not even close. First of all, yes, there are several hieroglyphs that supposedly demonstrate the use of these alleged drills, typically using them on tables, not granite slabs. Yet not a single copper tube drill artifact has ever been recovered from Egypt. Like, ever. They made these holes all the time. Shouldn't these copper tube drills kind of be everywhere? Right. Counter-argument. Copper was so valuable that they likely smelted it down for other uses. Every single last one of them. How convenient. But that's nothing compared to the machining marks found on this drill core. The infamous Petrie's core number seven found by Sir Flinders Petrie. And of course, the common Google debunker can search this up and find countless sources that irrefutably debunk this myth. But for those who can think for themselves, a little digging shows that something just doesn't make sense about this. Analyzing the core and wrapping a string of cotton around the grooves show the drill marks produced a continuous spiral down the entire core, which the bow drill method doesn't do, but rather horizontal lines that look nothing like the authentic Egyptian cores. It doesn't end there. Analysis confirmed by fringe theorists like aerospace engineer Christopher Dunn, who worked with machining tools his entire life, suggested that after studying the spacing of the drill marks on this core, the penetration rate of whatever method the ancient Egyptians used to drill this core must have been 500 times greater than our diamond drills today. His words, his conclusion, he obviously must be crazy. Oh, and let's not forget the clearly drilled holes for door hinges in temples like the Osirion. Those must have been quite the delicate task with a copper tube, right? And then there are the 40,000 plus stone vases and pots made from rocks such as granite, not clay. These were clearly lathe turned and had to be made with something rotary, similar to the drills that left all those mysterious drill cores behind. Now, that doesn't mean the drilling method was faster back then than it is today. It just means that according to his calculations, these ancient drills had a greater vertical penetration for every rotation of the drill than today's technology. This fringe analysis explains how the grooves on the drill core indicate a 0.1 inch of vertical penetration for every rotation of the drill head. Whereas modern diamond drills with a 900 RPM achieve about 0.0002 inches of penetration per rotation, 500 times less than the ancient method. It could have very well been, and probably was, slower with whatever drilling technique they were using back then. But this level of penetration is mathematically not possible with today's diamond drills, and clearly not with the bow drill. Consider the large modern core drills used on concrete building and road tunneling projects. These are manufactured with diamond tips and require immense pressure and forces to be effective. The cores produced by these modern drills bear a striking resemblance to the ancient ones, unlike the ones made by handheld tools. And then there are the strangely parallel concave grooves left by some tool at the unfinished mega obelisk in Aswan. These grooves, resembling scoop marks in ice cream, were actually produced by something akin to a smoothing, rotating tunneling machine roller drum that spun at high RPM, penetrating into the rock and leaving those distinctive striations behind. Now listen, I'm not saying they used lasers or advanced high-tech drills or anything like that. I'm also not fully dismissing it, but it seems so obvious to me and several other questioners that something was used here that they're just refusing to even acknowledge. Maybe the ancients had some sort of forgotten method to soften hard stone, making it malleable and easy to work with, that we're just unaware of. It seems as if these things were mass-produced from some sort of template, and not just individually made as one-off works by some sort of master craftsman.
And they definitely weren't made by slaves, because each of these is a feat of engineering on its own. The statues of in Abydos and Luxor, weighing up to 1,000 tons and carved from granite, present an enigma that defies the conventional understanding of ancient Egyptian craftsmanship. These colossal statues, akin to the Colossi of Memnon, suggest a level of technological prowess far beyond what is attributed to the ancient Egyptians. The precision and scale of these works imply they were created using advanced machinery or techniques that have been lost to history. This notion is further supported by the discovery of over a dozen massive serapium boxes in Saqqara, each weighing between 80 to 100 tons with lids over 20 tons. The box left in the middle of the passageway, immovable by modern teams due to the narrow passages, underscores the idea that these artifacts were created with advanced knowledge and methods that remain hidden from the mainstream narrative. These finds suggest a forgotten chapter of history where advanced civilizations may have flourished, their secrets buried beneath the sands of time. Okay, that's enough for now, because this is a rabbit hole that I don't think anyone's ready for. Honestly, I'm just glad that we can now accept that these were not made as tombs, and it's probably made for something else free electricity probably watch this i'm holding a banana does it look like i'm eating this banana how about now does it look like i'm eating this banana here's my bike here's the street and here's me going on a bike ride are you sure you know when that was i'm walking on a trail here i am at the top of a very large hill here's me taking a break on this trail i took my headband off because it's hot not everything is what it seems. Hey, isn't that my bike? Because it's really hot up here on this mountain. Wait, am I on a mountain? Not everything is what it seems. Did I run up here or did I drive up here? In fact, when our brains are presented with information that's not linear, oh my. I'm sure you recognize my bench? When did I take this? What happens is we start to put together all of the little inconsistencies between, and our brain creates a narrative for us. I mean, maybe I was on my treadmill this whole time, but then what about the car? This was six weeks ago. What about the mountain? Was this the same day or was this a different day? What about the trail? And what about the banana? Hey, isn't that my bike? Am I actually running? Would it surprise you to learn that I just took a piece off and put it on the counter? Anyone with a basic understanding of theatrics can trick you into thinking that the videos that you're seeing are actually happening in sequence. They can also trick you into thinking that a video you're looking at right now is happening sooner to you in this moment than a previous video that you watched. But how can that be if we're very confident that we know what we're seeing in a video? I mean, I'm in a car, right? And I'm driving, right? Even in cases where we've already had the wool pulled over our eyes and we know that something is actually happening. We don't actually know when something is going to continue to happen or if we're just going to start getting tricked. Not everything we see is what it seems. Add to the mix filters and there's actually no way to verify whether I'm recording this before the videos I just showed you, during the videos I just showed you, or after. What happens is, is we start to put together all the little inconsistencies between and our brain creates a narrative for us. So embrace skepticism. When you see a video, ask yourself, what am I being asked to believe? How do I know that this video that I'm watching is authentic? And how can I be confident that they're not just trying to make it look like something it's not? This is probably one of the uh, most educational video that we can ever watch pertaining to this subject. I mean, it's just a constant reminder to be careful of what we're watching, of what we're consuming online. <laughs> So just watch this video. 
So that is what's called a decenian glass. And I was told that in some countries it's even illegal to have one of those. This woman who made her own bread without buying any yeast from the store. And the way she did that was she did some research and she found that back in the day before they had instant dried yeast like they do now, they used the yeast that was already found on the skin of an apple and they soaked an apple in water for a few days so that it fermented and that made it so that the yeast grew and then you could use that apple yeast water and then pour it in flour to make your own bread. So I decided to do that myself just to see if it would work and this is how it went. This is what it looked like on day one. After I chopped up an apple, I put it in a cup of water and then let that whole thing rest for 24 hours. This is what it looked like on day two. As you can see, the water is a lot more murky. And when I opened it up, there were a lot of bubbles that were forming. And that's a sign that the yeast is active because as they're metabolizing, they produce a lot of carbon dioxide as a byproduct. And this is what it looked like on day three. When I opened it up, there was a lot of gases that released and there were a lot more bubbles that formed. So on day three, I um, strained all of the water and then discarded the apple and then mixed that water with a cup of flour gave that a whisk, and then added a tablespoon of sugar. I then poured the mixture into a jar and then let that rest for 12 hours before I opened it up again. This is what it looked like the next day. As you can see, it rose a lot, and when I opened it up, it kind of made a fizzing sound like when you open a soda can. I added half a cup of that mixture to two cups of flour and about half a cup of water and then kneaded that for a while until it formed a ball. After that, I decided to make another ball of dough, but this time with wheat flour. I then let both rise for about two hours. As you can see, they roughly doubled in size, which is exactly what I wanted to happen. With the first ball, I decided to make some cinnamon rolls, so you can see me rolling out the dough and then smearing some butter all over it, and then finally sprinkling some cinnamon sugar all over it. I cut the dough into some strips and then rolled them up and then placed them into a muffin tin. With the second ball of dough, I decided to make some pizza, so I flattened out the dough into a crust and then poured some sauce on it. This is what everything looked like before I put them into the oven. And this is what everything looked like when I took it out of the oven. It was so good, I highly recommend trying this out. Alright, that's it for today's session. Please let me know your thoughts in the comments. Let me know if you like or dislike this video so I can make better content. Thanks again everyone for showing up and I will see you around.